seconds to get there. Good morning. Welcome to CPV Chat. We have uh, we have a lot of really interesting things to, to talk about today and some great guests. But first, I'm going to read the disclaimer. Vehicle fires sometimes occur while people are filling metal gas cans placed on plastic surfaces. This type a fire usually involves a gas can in the back of a pickup truck with a plastic bed liner. Gasoline tends to carry a static electric charge when pouring gasoline into a can. This charge can build up on the can. If the can is sitting on the concrete or the ground, the static charge can safely flow away. But when the can is sitting in plastic, such as a plastic bed liner in a truck, the static charge cannot escape because the plastic is an insulator. That is, does not connect, conduct electricity. A spark can occur between the can and the fuel nozzle and, ignos, and ignite the gasoline. When the spark occurs in the flammable vapor space near the open mouth of the gas can, a fire occurs. Please be safe with your gas cans. Good morning. Um, I want to introduce, uh, we have two returning guests, but one new guest, uh, Gabby Dust Race. You want to introduce yourself and tell us what you do? Good morning. Um, so I'm a developer on the C++ team here at Microsoft. Um, very passionate about uh, tools for developers writing good, effective C++. And I work on the service committee and design language and all kinds of stuff. And you were also a special request in the chat room. I said, when are we going to have Gabby on? Because we want to hear about modules. <laughs> but can I add, can I add, Gabby don't just work for Microsoft. He used to be a maintainer for GCC. He also worked with Bjarne Strasstrup in Tamo University. He also a co-inventor of IPR, or maybe even like majority inventor. Well, they, <laughs> they will negotiate with Bjarne. So, so Gabby is huge. It's so awesome to have him on, uh, on CPP chat. <laughs> Wonderful to have your ego stroked, isn't it? Gore, tell us about you, because it's awesome to have you too, Gore. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Hi. I am. I work in the same team with Gabby. I sit only a few offices away from him. I really yeah. like IPR. I really like things <laughs> that Gabby does, like modules, IPR. Well, I also like routines, asynchrony, uh, networking, thread pools, and I don't like Stood Future. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Jason, you want to tell us a few things you like and maybe something you don't like as well? <laughs> uh, lately, I've been liking deduction guides as I've been playing with them more and more. Um, nice. Things I don't like are Emacs and um, <laughs> IDEs in general, I guess. <laughs> let's, Did you let's try talk, VS Code? Did you let's try about, VS Code? Let's talk Just about something try that's VS Code. controversial like politics or religion or sex or something like that. <laughs> let's not get into Emacs because I don't want something controversial in this show. <laughs> I just need to vote this afternoon, that's all. Well, well, since we're talking about controversial things, just a few weeks, Actually, well, there was like a, some collision uh, between two ships, and the ship that sunk my ship was from Gabby's uh, flag from uh, from the place where Gabby's from. So, <laughs> so you mean a, a Russian ship was Russians, sunk by? Yes, a Russian ship was sunk in Bosphorus Straits by hitting, or I don't, I'm not sure who hit whom, but <laughs> <laughs> anyway. It was Gabby's ship. Gabby's ship sunk uh, uh, Gora's ship. That was terrible. But everybody was safe. Everybody was safe. So people are safe. So you, so you went you went from being the inventor of IPR to a naval destroyer? <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's like, Gabby is so popular that like, ship, so that's claimed, good. ship claimed that he is from that country. So we do want to talk. We do want to talk about modules and uh, and and cool new features. But we want to do a little uh, roundup of the important things that happened this week. And probably the single most important thing in the C++ world that happened this week is that CPP Cast did their 100th episode with a very special guest. Uh, you want to tell us about it, Jason? Yeah, we had Bjarna on for our 100th episode special, and uh, talked to him about well the past, present, and future of C++. Plus, as Rob put it in the uh, synopsis, I think it was a pretty good conversation. It was it was fun to have him on. Yeah, and of course he's a good get. He's, you know, I think yeah. that most of your guests, uh, well, some of your guests are not well known, but most of your guests, I'd say, 
half of your guests, I'd say, are fairly well known to people who go to conferences and stuff like that. But right. most of your guests aren't known to anybody outside the C++ world. But, but this is one, one important exception. That people outside of C++ actually know who this guy is. <laughs> yeah, and we've and actually gotten comments, too, about how people love the fact that the guests that we have on are people that no one knows, basically. <laughs> yeah, the premise of your show is we're going to talk to working, working software developers about what they're doing. And I, absolutely, that's what I sign up for. Yeah. Um, and congratulations on the 100th episodes. That's, that's Thank you. That's a nice accomplishment. Yes, yeah. congratulations. And if you didn't listen to the episode, Bjarna actually does mention you, Gabby, and the work that you're doing, how important it is with modules. Oh, OK. Um, <laughs> thanks. And he used the word IPR. He did, yes. <laughs> um, actually, you know, as you say, it's, it's, it's nice. It was a nice conversation. It's nice to hear that. But one of the things about Bjarne being Bjarne is that he is invited. I mean, we get to hear what he has to say. He's invited to talk, and it's great. I like to have him at conferences that I host. But it's also nice to hear from people who don't have the same access to the microphone. So that's what makes the show great. Uh, not to say that it wasn't great to have him. That was exciting. Um, but, but, uh, but what you do every week is that's what I tune in for, and I appreciate that. Um, yeah. A hundred episodes, so that's two years, right? I mean, more yeah. or less two years. Wow. The Who was first, your first guest, by the way? Uh, you were the first <laughs> guest, but I wasn't around yet. Oh, that's right. That's right. It was it was just Rob and I the first. Yeah, you joined yeah. it pretty soon. What was it about? This episode seven or something. It was Hartmut's episode. It was pretty. Yeah, pretty soon. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was oh. like the week before C plus plus now two thousand fifteen. Mm. Okay. And you were preparing for that then, I think, right? Yeah, that's actually how I ended up on the show in the first place was Rob, well, you sent out a call for guest. Uh -huh. And I responded because mm -hmm. that was also the first conference that I was speaking at. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I remember distinctly was, that was both that of these we guys. Met? Was that was where that? we met? We met yes. uh, yeah. Yeah, both the, Gabby uh, and Gore were in my first talk that I ever gave. I recall them distinctly being there. <laughs> well, I it remember was, you I, saying kind of words about Microsoft Visual C++. Uh, no, I, I really liked the, uh, the presentation you oh, made. Oh, I, I, I liked it too. Uh, you know, uh, the importance of cross-platform uh, development and, and the tools. I was surprised that uh, you actually had uh, praise for Visual Studio you know, at the time. That, you know the perceptions outside was I was I, I, I liked what you had to say and so uh, I still well, like I, to get that message out there that Visual Studio has better warnings in some cases than still any of the mm -hmm. other compilers yeah what one of the things I would say uh, tooting the C++ now horn is that that this is the kind of audience that you get at C++ now uh, you know it, yes. it is it is a an intelligent, informed, engaged audience. And you'll have people like uh, Gabby and Gore and Jason in the audience when you give a talk at C++ now. And I'm not saying that to scare people away. I'm, I'm saying that, that um, it, is, it is a special opportunity. It's, it's a really cool conference. And one of the things that we're going to need to do in the next year is beat the drum a little bit because we're about 20-some attendees off of selling out. Now, oh, last wow. year, we were just short of selling out, so I wasn't too worried about it. It's kind of like selling out. And actually, if I had my choice, I'd rather be three or four people short of selling out because that way nobody get turned away. And I like that. But, but being 20 or 30 away from selling out when you're only a 150-person conference, that's, yeah. that hurts. So yeah. we're going to figure out how to market it and let people know I think CPPCon is a wonderful conference, but there's, there's, a, there's an environment at C++ now that you just don't get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. and, and part of it is what you just mentioned, Jason, which is that you have an audience that's made up of people who are you know, the, the leading people in the, in the industry. C++ now is a very special place to go. So uh, obviously it falls to me to figure out how to market it better because we really need, it's only 150 people. We need to sell that out every year without thinking, and, uh, and we didn't do that this year. So we'll have to figure out how to get the word out a little better. But anyway, so um, speaking of conferences, 
um, ACCU was a couple weeks ago. We talked about um, uh, we talked about the fact that Herb's talk is embargoed, um, and and it seems like there's more and more discussion of this. Uh, I noticed on Reddit that people were talking this week. It's like, well, that doesn't seem fair, <laughs> and it was like, you know, I'm looking at this from the point of view of, well, if if ACCU hadn't promised to embargo the talk, Herb wouldn't have given the talk. I mean, you know, it's like, <laughs> and because. Because Herb wants to make sure that the committee has a chance to evaluate what he's seeing before it before it goes to the public, which I think is, I think it's great, and uh, I'm impatient and chomping at the bit to see it, but it's the right thing to do. Otherwise, uh, the conference, the ACCU conference, isn't as nice. It, you know, the comments I saw from the people from the, from the people who attended the ACCU is that they felt like that keynote kind of set a new bar for them, and. Um, and that's that. That's wonderful. I'm glad it happened, and uh, uh, anxious to hear about meta classes. Uh, the other thing that that happened at ACC you want to talk about is uh, I watched um, Odin, who's been on the show a lot. Odin's talk, on, Odin Holmes, on uh, modern C++ design reloaded. So what he did was he took a look at at the book Modern C++ Design by um, Andre Alexandrescu which uh, was, despite the fact that it said modern, it was based on 2003 technology. What was modern was not the C++, it was the design element. It was heavily templatized things done at compile time that many of us didn't realize you could do at compile time. Um, and and w it was interesting to look back at it because I don't, I don't think I've reread the book since 2011. I mean, it, it made a huge impact on me and how I thought about code. In fact, it was one of the, you know, I, I enjoy C++ books a lot and used to just kind of pick them up and just read through them just for almost for the heck of it, just to see not as much necessarily what they were teaching me about C++, but what they were teaching me about how to tell people about C++. That's what I got out of it. But Andre's book, I would read a few pages and then I would set it down and think about it a while. I mean, that was a, a mental trip. And I still would recommend it to anyone. But, but Odin's talk kind of put it in perspective where a lot of the things that he spent a lot of time on, they're just not interesting to us anymore because in the world of C++14, some of the things that he had to jump through a lot of hoops to get, we just have them free and, and just kind of take them for granted. now. So that was a great talk. Hmm. Um, and I think the other big announcement that uh, we made this week is that registration for CppCon is open and we have announced 12 classes, six of them before the conference and six of them after the conference. And you want to say anything about the classes, Jason? Anything at all you want to say about? <laughs> about the class that I'll be doing? Oh, you're doing a class. That's right. <laughs> Tell us about it. Hello? Yes. <laughs> Are you guys there? Uh, did we lose you? Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, all, the, all the video, uh, like every single person's video froze for me for a second. Oh. So yeah, I'll be giving a class on C++ best practices for the conference. And the idea is to go over practical rules for how to write code that is well-performing by default, um, easy to maintain, easier to write, easier to read. Best practices. Yeah, yeah. Best practices. Excellent. Um, well, obviously, I'm wishing you the best of luck with that class. Um, <clears throat> and so the other announcement that hasn't been made yet, which I, which I hope to make on Tuesday, so this is a pre-announcement of announcement, is to open up uh, submissions. And the window for submissions won't be very long, so get those uh, submissions in as quick as you have the opportunity. It will, there will be an opportunity after C++ now, but, but it'll probably be a week after C++ now when everything has to be in. So it's so it's only a very short window this year. Um, be ready to do with that. All right. So are there any other announcements? Anything else that we should talk about that I didn't uh, that I didn't talk about? Oh, um, well, well, maybe we'll talk about that later. I, I forgot. I, I wanted to talk about uh, TSs because this is one of the things that came up in your interview with Bjarne. Remember, yes. um, he 
he said he thought TSs might work fine for libraries, but he didn't think very much of them for library for uh, language features. But let's maybe get into that when we start talking about some language features. What people had requested and what they wanted to talk about was modules. So um, why don't we start with just a brief description of what modules is trying to do, and then a, a little bit about how it's implementing that, and then a little bit about what's our status. Can you give us that as a basis for our discussion? Ken? Yeah, sure. That's uh, no, yeah, it's, it's a fair question. So, well, what are modules? So the, the idea here is you want a uh, language support to express the architecture uh, of your library or program when write a program, you take a dependency and something else, a component. Could be the standard library, but you know, most of the time it is third party libraries or it is something that's about outside the, uh, the, the center. Uh, the other thing is if you take C today, uh, the most of what we write is template, you know, class template, uh, function template, uh, kind of, and, and the basic completion model is that things go in header files. Uh, so when things go in header files, they're uh, vulnerable to, to macros. You you no longer know what, whether what you write now is going to have the same semantics when someone includes a few bunch of other macros in the same environment. Uh, you know, to just make a point, if you take any uh, standard library implementation they use, it's ugly, right? They use ugly names, and most of it is just to uh, protect against macros. And uh, if you unfortunately uh, happen to use names like mean and max on Windows platform, they, they have a macro. So you have to write your mean max uh, in parentheses. That is ugly. It should never be, uh, you shouldn't have to worry about it. It's really ugly and disgusting, but that's the kind of thing you have to do. So uh, you're vulnerable to macros. Uh, you, you know, you, you don't know the boundaries of, of your architecture because things just copy and paste it. When you include the header file, what happens is the compiler just go and, and copy and paste the content of uh, the existing uh, file. And the other thing is, um, when you combine those two, copy and paste and, and macro evil, uh, you get uh, extraordinary compile time because everything gets processed solid. Uh, well, you know, over and over again. And the third thing is, um, because of the macros, it makes it very difficult uh, to parse C++. You now, if you look at the source file, you look at header file or the source file, you, you know, as a machine, as a tool, you can't predict what they mean if you do not know all the macros that are necessary to compile the source file. So that means you have poor uh, tool support. Right. A lot of it is because of macros. Um, so what we're trying with modules is, hey, here is a language facility that allows you to say, uh, this is my um, library. I'm taking dependency on that guy. And that guy has a name. So we have a symbolic name to the library. And uh, yeah, you can use macros the way you want in your source file. The other guys can use macros the way they want in their implementations. But there is one thing. We don't get to pollute each other. We don't get to cause damage at distance. So that is the isolation, you know, micro isolation. Thing. It's fundamental. Uh, it's not just micro isolation. If you na use names for functions in your own implementation, we may have to make similar choices like swap, you know, some common names for operations. If those names are not exported, they're not part of your interface, the things that you say I can depend on, there is no reason for them to conflict at the link time. So you have to have a real isolation of your component. And that is because you have this clear boundary and HPC dependencies. And uh, yeah, once you get structure, that gives you structure. Once you get structure, the tool chain from the, uh, the lecture to the parser to the you know, code generator to the linker, they can now exploit those structures to give you a better combatant throughput or build throughput and uh, better safety. Now that you, if you abide by that and get rid of these macros, you can actually help tool builders to give better tools to developers for them to be more productive. So in the end, uh, modules bring you um, better architecture 
increase safety, then we, you know, in C++, we, we take very uh, seriously the notion of one definition rule. Uh, and the only trouble with it is that today it is a, uh, it's a proof burden on the developer or the developers, not something that the um, tool chain actually enforces in a way that is useful. Uh, you, you have to ensure that you define only once. How do you know that? Well, in time, you can say, hey, you have double definition. With modules, you take one definition rule as fundamental. It's an action of some sort. And build everything from there. That means the tool chain, the compiler can now actually help you much better and, and detects uh, earlier errors and that kind of stuff. So modules bring you better um, understanding um, so how it would, uh, modules help the compilers uh, enforce uh, ODR and give you better semantics because it's so, special safety because it is built now into the tool, the entire tool chain. So a couple of things that, that, that I thought of it as you were saying this is the emphasis you're putting on macros. And the reason is because I don't think about this as a programmer. I say I want to pound include foo.h. And in every every header that I pound include foo.h, I assume that pound including foo.h is 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 giving me the exact same source. But the compiler can't make that assumption because okay. the compiler understands that that what's in foo.h might be dependent on the macros that I have defined before I say pound include foo.h. As right. a developer, I'm hoping that isn't true because I probably am not trying to to make any change to some library that, that I, unless it happens to be a foo.h header that I want to be able to say, you know, pound include some debug mode flag or something like that. But in the general case, I don't want the macros that I define to affect headers that I depend on because I don't know what magic those expect and that's not how I want to do it. But of course, even though that's the default situation, the compiler can't assume that. And so every time we include foo.h anywhere in our application, the compiler has to go out and recompile it again because of the possibility that any given macro might be defined to what actually changed the yeah. definition. Yeah. And um, that is an awful lot more work for us in terms of cycles spent on the computer to, to mm -hmm. recompile this and recompile it and recompile it on the oh, off chance oh, that yeah. there might be, which is totally legal code, uh, you know, I might have defined a macro that does in fact change the behavior of the library, but that's not rare, it's not common, and it's probably not really the best way to define a library like that. So yeah, unfortunately, uh, we, we do have some libraries like that. Um, you know, I, I don't want to pick on just one, so I'm going to uh, equally abuse, you know, both worlds, for example. So uh, in the GNU world, uh, you know, if you, if you include header, depending on whether you define a macro GNU resources, you're not going to get the same thing out of it, right? And, and similarly, on Windows platform, uh, before you include Windows at eight, if you define Unicode, you're not going to get the same thing out of it, right? Uh, you know, the way you, you prevent the min-max macro I was talking about earlier, you have to define right. macro call no min-max. It, it, it's, it's just insane. Yeah. Um, and, and the complexity that goes with that, you know, so the modules here is to support you at scale, right? You know, I'm not talking about small scale where you have a class, you know, it really, when you have hundreds of thousands, millions of source files, you know, you, you're dealing with something in scale, you, you want to understand that. You, you can't just load those files in your IDE and stare at them and, and, and get, you know, understanding, no, you, you need automated tools under some semantics to help you with this. Or, and it was like being, uh, you know, prevented from being commonplace because of things we're talking, these macros that can just change things, you know. The preprocessor is not, doesn't have a lot of structure, right? You have tokens and that's all. It's just too flexible. Right, so our, our current system is based on a text processing hack that that's dates right. back to at least the 70s. That's and right doesn't necessarily scale very well. So we would like to be able to replace that with something that's actually language-based. So instead of saying, oh, by the way, you're gonna include this file and there's gonna be some parts of our language in there and it's gonna be included a number of different times. And as long as, this is the other thing that I wanted to mention is the one definition rule, which a lot of people don't really understand, but the point of the one definition rule is what if you included a header in your program several times and it actually did 
mean something different because of macros or something like that. The compiler can't guarantee anything. So the one definition rule burden is entirely on the developer, which is if you give it, you know, garbage in, if you give it something where you've in your somewhere in your program you've defined some class in debug mode and somewhere else you define it in non-debug mode nothing's guaranteed yep. because you violated the one definition rule and the compiler doesn't have to warn you of this the linker doesn't have to warn you of this it's entirely on you yep. that that you don't violate the one definition rule and and then and then if you do yeah you're totally on your own. No, nothing's guaranteed this is uh, this is a terrible situation. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 it might work when you have one or two source file and, and and say, well, you shouldn't you shouldn't be allowed to open a, uh, an editor if you're not competent enough. But it actually, doesn't scale as a strategy, right? You know, we're talking about programming at scale. You, you just can't assume that all the dif different actors and programmers or teams are making the same assumptions you know, about these very fine grain, you know, configuration macros. It, you know, you, you need uh, a way to have a better understanding and enforcement of the system at Globals, and that has to be done by a tool. And the okay, best so place to go is the, the tool chain. Okay, so you've got a proposal that's Calling the proposal a little, little underwhelming. It's an implementation. You've got a, a working concept. It's in the TS now. How exactly? What What's the magic that we're doing? Do we have to learn a whole new language? Is this uh, written in XML or something? How do I des describe what my class, what my library is that I want to export? So, it's a very good question. Um, the this is a living language. Uh, we've already had existing code, some of them are working the way they were supposed to, to work, and others really need help. Um, the, the first thing we want to do is, the, you know, when we design libraries, programs, we have the architecture in our minds. And, you know, just like I said earlier, you take dependencies, or right? you import something, or you, you want to build a library, so you want to expose to your, your, your consumers something, so you export something. So basically, you have two concepts. Uh, import, I'm taking dependency, export, I'm providing you this. And then you want to exp uh, express boundaries. So you have module declaration. Say, from now on, um, every declaration in, in this code belongs to this module. So those are the three basic blocks of, of this movement. And that's all you need to know. So, so when you say from now on, if I say, here's a module, is that from there to the end of the text file, which seems a little arbitrary, or is it actually scoped? Are there braces that say everything? So modules, you know, it's uh, uh, module declaration. When you say you, when you start setting the boundary, uh, uh -huh. it has to be at global scope. You know, somewhere. Not within a namespace. No, not within a namespace. Not within a function. Really, the global scope. Okay. And every declaration that appears after that module declaration is owned by that module. So there is this notion of ownership. So the a notion of ownership goes back to the ODR. So the idea of the ODR, the one definition rule, is that uh, an entity is defined exactly at one place. Well, if you define that place, that place is, uh, is the property of someone, and that someone is the module, and you define only one, that place. And if that declaration, if that entity has to be used by a lot of other people, and it has to be made visible, that's where you export it. And people who want to consume use that entity. They just import a module, and the system would make available to them the uh, the names of the entities that are exported. So, um, do I get? How do I? How, how does how is this packaged then? I mean, do we still have the equivalent of headers, or I mean, how, how so, do I? Uh, in an ideal world, let's say in five years, when we all get uh, modules and what's the goal? Well. Yeah, where are we going to be when it's yeah. when it's so? Ideally, you shouldn't need uh, include you know header files. Uh, you might still need uh, includes to do things that are just text processing, but not. Um, way to architecture your program, right? The you know, preprocessor is not going away anytime soon. Yeah, it's not going anytime soon, but you can definitely reduce its use to just generating text, 
like you know we have all this practice where we define data in some source file and we encode it to, to generate tables that kind of stuff that, that those users are not modular they are expressly to just generate text so in five years i hope most users of includes are like that um ideally what you have is you say imports uh, i'm taking dependency on that component and that's all you say you say imports module name and the compiler acknowledge okay good it doesn't actually do anything right away. It probably just brings the names of the entities that are exporting the global scope. But, but it, has to have, it has to have seen the code that says. Yeah, so it, yeah, that module has been, I'm assuming, has been compiled, made available to you uh, earlier. But it doesn't right away reprocess anything that has already. Right, right, right. Processed. So what, I guess what I'm saying is that somehow I'm going to have to have a build. A build file or something which says process everything in this file and then process everything in the. I mean, right now when I compile something, I give it a single, effectively a CPP file, whatever it actually is. But I give it a CPP file and it sucks in a bunch of headers, mm -hmm. and each one of these is independent. Yeah, and it's not until I get to the linker that I care about the fact that a certain set of these is actually one application. That, that, that's right. So you know, in, in the multiple world, what will happen is you effectively have to first compile the interface file, because all the others implementation files that are collectively implemented modules, they have an implicit dependency on the, on the interface, right? That's where you say all oh, these types that you declare. Uh, so you compile that first, then you, you know you have that implicit dependencies on the on the source file. Uh, depending on the implementation, depending on the compiler, when the compiler compiles the uh, uh, the interface file, it produces probably an object file, and at the same time, a metadata. That's just some kind of logical description of types that you export and that kind of stuff. And when you uh, compile any other source file that depends on that interface file, you only need that metadata. So will there still be separate files? Will there be a separate interface file and implementation file for every module? So, yeah, so that becomes a choice for the architect, uh, architect. So the architect could decide, oh, I want everything in just one source file, and where only things that are explicitly exported will be visible. But everything else can just be in one source file. That's basically what you do with Java. Um, if you if you strongly believe that you need to separate implementations at the source level from the interface, you could still continue to use your different uh, uh, source file, and that will work as well. So here, um, the, the goal explicitly supports both, not impose that you have to put everything in a single source file, or that you have to move uh, definitions out into .3.5. You know, if you put a definition in the uh, interface file, the compilers know how to separate that from the rest. Okay, so you, so don't, you don't get multiple, uh, you know, symbol linker error, that kind of stuff, no. So Gore has given us a little example in the chat room uh, where we've uh, defined a module and then we export certain things. Mm -hmm. after, after we define, after we say, this is module A, mm -hmm. then we can, uh, I, I assume the struct S is making something that's not exported until the next line where it's explicitly exported. I so, can define anything so, I define as uh, private. So here, struct X is is probably an implementation detail local to the module, and the the type that is being exported is T, which derived from S. So S is uh, being used to some uh, say, some kind of private implementation detail that he doesn't want uh, he, okay. you know, the consumers of A to, to use. Okay. So. When you put all implementations in one file like that, the compiler knows. So you know, this, this is one possible implementation. It's at least the one that I know is in the Visual C++ uh, compiler. Uh, okay. it, it, it put out that uh, the type T is exported. And it also knows its definition. And, and uh, everything just were fine. S is not exposed to your consumer. Today, you cannot do that in header file, right? Because it is copy and paste. Of course, of course. Uh, Miro has a question. He's saying, so multiple interfaces are not possible. I have to cram every exported declaration into one file. OK, yeah. So that's actually a very good question. It is touching a, uh, a point. So originally, in the current TS drive, uh, when you define a module, uh, it has a bunch of source file that made up the module. And there is a one single 
distinguished source file. We call it interface source file, where you put all the interfaces, you know, so all the uh, declarations that make up the interface. Right? Um, that is was deliberate uh, restriction. I understand that many people don't like that, but it was a deliberate decision. It is not a final decision, but. I needed that so that we can quickly start talking about how we use multiples sure, sure, and sure. have an implementation. Well, but, and, and in fact, you could, you could pound include files that's, that's, beneath that's, the declaration. That's, if you, that's right. If you, really, so, if you really have a library that's got, and, and some people do have a library mm -hmm. that's got you know, 40,000 entry points, then mm -hmm. uh, divide them up. Mm -hmm. But you can still import them with a single module. Yeah. So for Toronto, uh, there will be at least a paper. I say at least one paper because I'm going to write one um, uh, that suggests how you could split your uh, interface definition over a serial source file, right? If you don't want to use includes, like you should just explain how it work. Uh, um, and, and, and um, have the standard community look at it. I can tell you that in the compiler released right now, and this has been supported to for at least 10 months now, you can split the interface files or several source files, but you have to give them on the same command line to, to cl.exe, to the compiler. And the compiler knows how to compile them and put everything together to generate this uh, metadata. Uh, that, that is not uh, specified in the current draft. Uh, I'm just trying to illustrate the fact that that restriction there is not final. But I need it there. I need it to be there so that we can move on to the more interesting things. OK, well let's, well, let's talk about it. So, so what's the state? You have an implementation. This implementation is already in Visual Studio. People can play with That's it right, right now. That's right. Um, how do they do that? They have to have a flag that says "turn this on." Or that's right. So uh, Visual uh, C plus plus is is a commercial product, and, and people who buy Visual C you know, it is free, but you know you can also buy a license for it. Uh, expect certain level of support, and so the question is, how do you satisfy the demands of this, uh, the, the community, which is it really needs the facility for modules? Uh, at the same time, you want to say, hey. Uh, we are not quite sure about this yet. We're giving this to you as preview. So we say this is experimental feature. So you need to have a flag that says slash experimental colon module. And when you do that, the compiler automatically turns into the mode where it supports module, it recognizes module uh, imports as keyword. Export is already a key keyword. And it understands all your, your structs. Um, when you need to compile the interface file, you can either use the suffix IXX for the interface file, or you can keep your CPP extensions, and then in that case, you need to say slash module colon interface to tell the, uh, the compiler this source file really is the uh, interface file. So uh, so you, you have a proposal. I remember this proposal being discussed in Kona, not the last Kona, but the Kona before that. That's right. And that's when it got voted into uh, uh, a TS, and I think right. that might have been part of, and this is what, what one of the things that Bjarni said on his uh, on his interview on, on Jason's show was that uh, TS, as he thought, for language features were a way of kind of delaying uh, delaying rather than advancing the, the, the process. And I think what happened was that voting modules into the TS at Kona, I think, was kind of a, a compromise because there were people who had different ideas about how modules should be and uh, some people were saying, this proposal is ready now. Let's put it in the standard. And other people were saying, no, there's, there's issues with it. And the compromise was, well, let's put it in the TS. So it looks like there's some progress. I think Bjarni would say, no, that's not progress at all. It's either in the standard or it's not. I think, I think it, it is progress. It's showing a commitment on the part of the committee that we like it. Um, it's, it's showing that we're not completely all 100% on it, but we we like it and we're moving forward with it. Isn't that? Um, um, I think it's so can I comment on that, actually? So, yeah, I want you to. So, <laughs> so I'm also the project editor for, for Module TS, uh, in addition to being implementation and getting some other stuff. And uh, so I am not completely pleased with the fact that it is a, uh, is a TS, but 
you're absolutely right. Because it is in TS, we can make some progress. Like now we have, we have a specification, people can look at it, give us feedback uh, to complete. Uh, but because it is also a TS, it means that we have to decide which uh, version of the language you're targeting. So modules are targeting C17. It means that um, there are certain other features that we most likely are going to have that I cannot talk about right away. Example would be concept because it's in its own TS. There, there are interactions between concept and, and module. You know, uh, when you put concept and modules together, that makes C++ really a different language. Uh, really. Uh, but th there are interactions, and I cannot put those interactions in the specification yet because we're targeting C++ 17, which doesn't include concept. And then once at some point we move the TS draft into the standard, then we now have to struggle to try to fix all the other interactions that we were busy ignoring before. So um, I don't know, I, I like it. I, I, can t I, I can see where the progress is. Now we have this compromise. We, we, we talk more openly about it. Everybody is, is, not, is expecting it. But at the same time, we're delaying some work that needs to be done. How does it you know, interact with some other language features that we can't talk about because they are currently out of scope? I've got a question about modules. Mm -hmm. um, so historically, with templates, you need uh, the text of the template. Does modules affect that at all? Or are we still going to be using header files for templates? Um, so with modules, um, we are not attempting to do separate compilation of templates. Okay. okay. So what we are trying to do is that if you export a template, the, the definition of that template, whether it's a class or function, must be somehow available to the compiler when uh, the template is used. You know, when you import a module and that export this template, it, it has to be available. So there is a restriction here. You know, it's like you have to put the definition of the exported template in the source file that contains the interface definition of the module. You, you, cannot, you cannot hide the template body somewhere uh, far away and then import the module, use the template, and, and expect the compiler to go and figure it out where you, you, you put it. So the idea is you, you, you put it in, this, in, the, in the file that contains the, the interface file. And in practice, what happens is that the compiler is going to process your template once, which is you know, what it is usually, and, and store a, a logical description of the definition and everything and the metadata. So on import, if you don't use the, the template, the compiler is not going to reprocess again that template. So that, th that thing we pay for every time, we don't pay for that. Okay. Now, if, if you do use the template that requires instantiation, as the language requires today, then the compiler knows where to find it because it's all, you know, we put, we made other rules to say, oh, the, there is a strong connection between the source file that contains the interface of the module and the template definition, right? Okay. And then the compiler knows how to retrieve it and do the instantiation. But there is a huge difference here between what we do with header files, which is we don't reprocess the template definition, even if it is not instantiated. Right? Okay. That's, that's a huge saving. Okay. And, yeah. Go ahead. So. So I'm, I, what I'm trying to what I'm trying to get to is the state, and I think we've hinted at it a little bit. There is a TS. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's now a target for additional changes, including uh, at least one paper that you're planning to write. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how? Where are we in implementation? I assume that the Microsoft implementation is very close to your proposal, yeah. or to the TS. What about other platforms? Is there a modules implementation that, that I can use as a GCC user? Is there a modules implementation that I can use as a Clang user? And how close are those to the, to the TS uh, as so, it stands now? Yeah, so you're absolutely right that uh, the Microsoft implementations is tracking very closely uh, 
the, the specification. People will tell me, oh, is it, what's the distance? So, you know, I was in France recently and I had a friend, you know, kind of suspicious and say, no, 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 really, it's very close. Like, oh, yeah, because Microsoft used to put a spec and implement something else. No, no, no. We're tracking this, or we're dead serious about this standard, we're tracking very close. Um, Clang, before we started uh, with this TS, Clang used to have uh, something called uh, Clang modules based on module maps, uh, which uh, Richard Smith explained at the last VBCon as their attempt at trying to reconstruct the notion of modules based on C++ 98 notion. Uh, but since then, they have also been very busy at work uh, trying to implement uh, the current uh, draft, uh, the TS draft. Um, I know there are some differences, like I think they are still insisting that uh, module declaration has to come first. I think they're trying to enforce that. I'm not quite sure. Last time I checked it, it was that a month ago. Is that, is that what Gore was mentioning? Gore said something cryptic about this in, in, on his, uh, his last appearance on this show. He said, you know, do you think that the module statement has to come first in the module? Uh, no, I was just trying to probe your opinion because this was one of the big controversies. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, uh, yeah. So, so, yeah, so yeah, I think they, they, they have implementation that's closed. They are not enforcing the name visibility yet. I think at some point they will do that. So they have something you can play with. Uh, GCC, so my friend uh, Nathan Sidwell, uh, who you know, worked in previous life at Code Sorcery, uh, is now at Facebook and, and he is working on GCC implementation. So you know, I talk to him quite regularly. Um, it is not in Trunky, it is on a branch called CXX uh, modules. I think someone just uh, sent a link on the uh, Ah, there you go. On the chat. And, uh, and, and, and Nathan is documenting what he's doing or the states of the implementation is. Yeah. So, um, you know, Nathan is a very good, uh, excellent engineer, and I have uh, high confidence that very soon uh, we will be able to, um, uh, to use GCC for modules. One thing I should say is that you know, Facebook you know, is, is highly interested in, in C++ and particular C++ modules. So they want to use both Clang and GCC to compile the, the source code that's using uh, modules. So they, they, they want to see uh, the module implementation in both compilers. And, and I guess that also pushes to, uh, we all have to converge uh, to, you know, on the same uh, oh, technical cool. specification. Yeah, there's lots and lots of companies out there that are using multiple compilers. And the reason they're doing that is because they're on multiple platforms and they've got, they've got libraries spanning platforms. And of course, they're going to want to use modules. And yeah, if you don't have the same definition of what a module is or the same uh, understanding, the same mental model, if you will, of what the modules is, this, this isn't going to work at all. So, yeah. so the, reason was, yeah. the reason I was mentioned that is, you know, when we say the TS is the way to experiment with an idea and so forth, and some implementers go and implement things extra or differently. But when you have a uh, large company, you know, <laughs> that depends on on multiple compilers uh, for the same source code base, that reduces divergence, right? You. Right. So but we're not quite there yet. It sounds like the GCC is not, it's not in their main line. He started in, in January and uh, they think you, you know, I, I can speak to because that has been my personal experience and I'm seeing that now with uh, the work that Nathan is doing is because we, you know, modules take the uh, one definition role very seriously. Mm -hmm. um, it forces compiler writers to be very honest with their own the destructions, right? You know, some, sometimes it's like, oh, it is not exactly right, but nobody is going to notice. But when you start say, you know, you know, persisting the data structure on disk, they can read it back in terms of metadata. You, you really want to be disciplined and consistent. Otherwise, uh, well, it crashes, right. and that's not a good experience. So, so one of the work that you know, part of the work that Nathan has been forced to do is to put more. Uh, structure in and to just see his internal representation. You can see his notes on his wiki. Right. So essentially, um, the, the TS I'm assuming doesn't mandate how this is done, 
That's but right. a compiler has to have some kind of intermediate representation That's of right. a digested source file That's right. that will get sucked in on the export command, right? That's right. Yeah. Or on the so, import command. Yeah, so the, the standard doesn't say how you implement this file compiler. It says do whatever you have to do, but these observable behavior must be observed uh, the same way. Um, so there's a lot of debate about what happens when you compile an interface file. Do you, do you compile it or do you reprocess all the time? Of course, you can go reprocess all the time, but that's negative. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you compile, you have to save some something out. And the question is, what do you save in what format? And a few people say, oh, C++ is uh, text. C++ is the best representation of C++. Like, come on, you can't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> can tell me that a, a, a notation that requires a uh, thousand pages uh, of arcane rules that have been debugged at every uh, meeting, the main chain is could possibly the best representation of what? No, that's a better way of doing that. And, and fortunately, um, but more than 10 years ago, uh, 12 years ago, actually, when I was uh, at uh, ANN and Texas and I was professor there with, uh, with Biane. We set out, we were thinking about module, we we're thinking about just representation of C++ programs, understand what it means. Um, we set out to build a data structure that could represent any C++ program, valid, and some of them even invalid. And we call it the Internal Program Representation, IPR. Um, and now it is open source, it is on GitHub. If you look after my name, you know, Gabriel Dostres in GitHub, is that here, is there. You wrote a paper that explains the, the, the design and the challenges, and it's quite efficient. Uh, so when I came to Microsoft, and uh, one of the things I wanted to do was to build modules, you know, uh, like, what should I use uh, as you know, metadata format? Like, wait a minute, I think I've been here before. 10 years ago. And so I dust up my app here. And, and so you know, the, the design the format on this is, is directly influenced by the app here. Uh, one of the tools that I'm hoping to put out uh, to point uh, is a, a way for programmers to actually read in memory uh, the metadata that the compiler is emitting, but in a way that is easy for them to use using the IPR interface. So that will come. I haven't released that yet. It will come. But you know, between uh, getting everything ready for uh, Toronto, uh, or it was Kona, and getting implementation ready and, and build system. Someone has mentioned a build system. We will get go to that at some point. Uh, I just haven't had a cycle to to go back and, and build the, the connection between the IFC, you know, internal representation, so on disk representation in, in IPR, but that will come. And uh, I hope that will also help people start with uh, semantics based, uh, semantics aware uh, developer tools. Th that is something we don't have a lot of today. And that you know, people, when they move away from C, say, well, we don't, we don't have the productivity tools. And they don't just mean the IDE. It, it means, you know, factoring, you know, based on semantics, not just text, right? Uh, you know, you're moving from C++ 11 to 17 or 14. Uh, we have improved the language in many ways. So you want to have the, the, the new app construct because you know, your, your engineers are more up to date with that. So that's best done if it is automated. So you, and, and you automate that with tools that understand the language. That's why you need this app here. It, it can represent if you have a global view of a program. It has the meaning to it. So is there a, uh, a, a C++ source to IPR compiler, translator, converter, whatever you would call that thing? So that is the next tool that I, I want to build. And, and I, I know that uh, Gore, uh, every day, uh, at least for the last couple of weeks, can come to work and knock on my door. Or even when we go home at uh, <laughs> 10 PM, I got emails. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he, can, he can speak more to that, Gore. Uh, yes, I do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that so, will come uh, very, very soon. I hope. You know, I'm hoping that uh, the 
the committee will help me here, which is we, we need to move faster and we're talking about TS. We need to move faster with this TS. Uh, it is not going, you know, not just because it is TS, but it is nothing will change. That is false. Uh, it, things are going to change, but we need something that gives um, predictability uh, to people that there is this thing and then people are going to implement it. So for example, it was critical that we had a TS that way uh, some companies uh, could allocate resources to start working on the compiler you know, to implement this, this TS, right? We, we can't just leave things in papers and talk at the museum about these and other stuff. We, we have to move. And I'm hoping that the committee will help me move this quickly in Toronto. So that I can move on to the next thing, which is we need the tools, right? Right now, I'm stuck in, you know, fiddling with wording. And it's, it's nice, we've done it for two meetings, but becomes very boring and uninteresting. We have to do it for a year. <laughs> um, and, and then spend time on the things that matters to people outside WG21, it's programmers who want to use the modules. If they don't have these productivity tools, it's going to be difficult for them to move to modules. We can't expect people to go back and refactor their uh, existing code base to use modules manually. We, we, we have to have the tools. You know, remember, modules are programming, are for programming at scale. So we're talking about thousands of, of source files and, and looking at the architecture of your libraries. And, and that has to be done by tools. I would like to move on to that. So uh, please, WG21, help me. All right. One of, the, one of the tools I think you're hinting at is something that we were talking about earlier is solving what I think is a, a much bigger problem than modules, not to say that modules isn't a problem that needs to be solved. I think getting away from the text processing hack and being able to express in the language what I'm trying to express when I, when I think about a library, that's wonderful and good. But as a practical matter of being able to quickly build code and ship code, the fact that it's hard to to pull down packages and figure out what the right version of the package is and make sure I have the latest version and finding it and getting that, that library to build on my platform with whatever flags are the appropriate flags, that's a mess. That's a huge problem. And it's not like nobody's thought about solving it. It's been attempted many times. Uh, yes. This is what uh, B Code was attempting to do. And I think those guys are now working on something called Conan. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. we're going to, um, uh, there's, there's just a lot of other tools. And I think that, uh, I think that modules may actually support that, but modules mm -hmm. itself isn't enough. And I, I kind of get the impression that the standards committee isn't really ready to step up to this because it's really extra language. It's not really, it's yeah. not really part of the language design. There's so much that's platform specific. There's so much that has to do with compile flags and, and build tools and all sorts of things that really, I mean, really as contentious as, contentious as the standards committee might be. <laughs> <laughs> At really? Least they're not, they're not fighting over, you know, CMA, right? Um, yeah, so you're absolutely right in, in your description of what's going on. And uh, it's quite, quite, quite interesting to see that C. And so poor support from packaging perspective, yet it's successful. So there's something there, I don't know what it is. Uh, but uh, yes, we need packaging system. And you're correct, this is not something that WG21 talks about or is interested in because it is first and in programming language, not packaging system. But I am interested in build, giving C++ developers the best tools they can possibly get. And packaging is one of them. You know, build system is another one. So my, my next thing after um, modules is, of course, to look at packaging. Uh, and there are a lot of efforts today. You know, if, you, if you're on Linux, they already have their own packaging systems, that kind of stuff. On Windows, they now they have a VC package. And on Mac, they have Mac port, the homebrew. You know, so, the, it is not that there is none. There are just too many of them. And, and, and most of the time, uh, platforms come with their own opinion and view of what a package should be for the ones that happen. Um, 
but the C++ community still needs, uh, you know, way to, to consume packages very, very quickly. Uh, my view is that a good packaging system will leverage modules uh, because now the, 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 the architecture and the boundaries and the dependencies are uh, better known, better expressed directly. And you can as leverage well that. as debuggers, linkers. There are so many things that in your pipeline that can leverage uh, modules. Have you seen your BDB size, sizes of the files, you know, debug information? Some yeah. of it can be getting from modules. So it's not just the build system, a lot yeah. of things. So a, a lot of things there you know, could, could be improved, but you need to get the, the modules there first. And that's why I've been stuck on this thing. I'm hoping that uh, I'll get help from W21 to, to, to be unstuck to move uh, forward. Um, and then we'll need a way for the community to expect some kind of, oh, right? You know, it, it makes no sense to have a packaging system if we we don't have common ways of expressing, oh, I need this package, and, and if I provide um, a library, and I need a way to describe that to other people, other C++ programmers, you know, to, to consume them. So we're going to, uh, to work on that. And the other thing that I think is fundamental, too, uh, for success of modules and packaging is build. Right? Uh, I don't know how many build systems are there, but just too many to count, uh, including at my current employer. They you know, have too many of them. <laughs> uh, we, we need um, a way to, to expose the architectures at the module level to the build system so that you can, you can build uh, your, your, your library is very quickly and you get the right dependencies, take advantage. So we, we don't just want to stop processing the same thing over and over again. We also want to take advantage of the many cores we have today, of the, uh, the, the cloud system, the cloud world. We, we, we well, want I mean, to compile only things that need to be compiled. Right? Yeah, and I for that, you, you need a way to express it. I think there's a lot of needs. In fact, I think, I think Robert's kind of, uh, Robert made the comment, he says, it's not even clear what a C++ packaging uh, system uh, for source would actually do. And, and there is, you know, would, would that include um, having some kind, of, uh, some, some kind of list of libraries available so that I can say, I just want to, like I can do with, with, with Python. Don't you say pip, pip, or something like that? And just say the name of the library. And then mm -hmm. have some tool on my system that goes out, finds it, pulls it down. Um, that's is that is that part of it, or is it just uh, being able to integrate it into once I have it? I mean, there's we could spend a lot of it's time a lot of details, about yeah. what, what is what is it that we want it to do? Unfortunately, we're out of time now, and I don't want to oh, okay, yeah, say we're our welcome. So, <laughs> um, so we'll have to have a discussion yeah. in the future about what the ultimate C plus plus packaging system would be. Great, sure yeah. all the guests we'll for that. <laughs> You know, if I get a chance to come back to your show, uh, you know, we'll, they, well, yeah. we we'd love to have you back. We certainly uh, we certainly talk about things that you're working on, and so uh, and so we'd love to have your uh, your point of view on that. And, and, and uh, th thank you again for returning, Gore, and uh, for uh, for being a cheerleader for IPR. Yeah, <laughs> I'm here for some more. Yeah, uh, and, and thank you, John. And I want to thank the uh, C plus plus community. You know, I've, you know, have been extremely supportive. Uh, it, it, it is good to know because sometimes when we face all these daunting tasks and, and, and all the negativity, it, it's good to know to be reminded that this is really important. A lot of people depend uh, depends on this and, and, yeah. and to make progress and and hear from people who actually go to use this as opposed to many of us just designing and, and so forth. And I want to also want to thank you, uh, Jason, for, for coming on and for uh, sharing with us. Did you have any thoughts about a packaging system? You mentioned something about, what is, I've never even heard of CPAC. A CPAC is part of CMake. Robert uh, was asking what CPAC does. Um, it's just a cross-platform packaging. It does, it does what you expect it to do on each platform. So it can make an installer on Windows, a Debian package on Linux, an RPM. It can make... Uh, 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 virtual disk images on Mac OS, whatever. 
My main thought, though, about this entire conversation is Gabby is so smart that he needs no reference books on his bookshelf. <laughs> Good eyes. <laughs> So uh, James McNellis had accused me of strategically placing my uh, canoes. Yes, your canoes so are there, see. yes. And yeah. I, I will be quite honest and say, if I was going to strategically place anything, it would be my Mac. That's an original 1984 Mac I poster. I see. Uh, <laughs> that I'm proud of. Canoes books, you can buy those anywhere. You cannot get one of those Mac posters. I mean, it looks like it's seen too many days in UV light. Huh? There's Actually, only that's, that's true. It used to... It used to be, it used to be a completely <laughs> different color, it faded, yeah. uh, which is a, a crying point for me. Anyway, um, but we need to wrap up. We need to say mm -hmm. to everyone, um, wish them safe coding. There mm -hmm. will be one more uh, opportunity for us next Saturday morning. We'll have a, we'll have another uh, CPP chat then, mm -hmm. and I'm kind of hoping to have maybe a couple of CPP chats at the conference mm -hmm. okay. because with all the people who are at the conference, it's it's just too good an opportunity to pass up. Unfortunately, I haven't scheduled this. I'm not sure exactly when this will happen or how it will happen because we have this richness of, of potential guests, but we don't have really a richness of opportunities on the schedule that are just crying out to have people uh, sit down and chat. But maybe I will uh, convince some people to skip lunch one day or something and we'll have a chat then. I don't know what we'll do. But anyway, stay tuned for those announcements. In fact, that's why... Uh, I haven't really, I don't think I've announced any any episodes after this next Saturday, and it's because I'd like to do one or two at the conference, and I'm not sure when and how that's going to happen. Okay. Um, uh, anyway, so I want to give everybody a chance to wish everybody uh, safe coding, and uh, I'll start by saying to everyone, thank you very much for tuning in, and safe coding. Thanks, John, for inviting me, and thanks to everybody who's following all the questions I haven't been able to answer yet, and I hope to uh, get back with uh, more news uh, at some point. Thank you. Safe coding. All right. Thank you, guys, and we will uh, see you in a week. <laughs>